Hello, good morning everybody. Thank you for being here today for the Financial Literacy and Education Commission's field hearing on post-secondary education. My name is David Sue. I work at the U.S. Department of Education in the Office of the Undersecretary. So on behalf of the Commission members who are here today, I'd like to welcome you all, but also thank you for welcoming us from Washington uh, here to the University and to Madison. Um, I'd like to recognize the Chair and the Vice Chair of the um, FLEC Commission. We have uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Coity, who's here, and Director Cordray uh, from Treasury and CFPB. Uh, the Department of Education has a great working relationship with these two agencies, and we're really proud of the work that's being done in D.C. Um, to address the uh, financial capability of all Americans. Uh, today's hearing is very timely. The topic of uh, financial literacy and financial capability for all Americans uh, has never been more important. Uh, our young people today will be faced with many uh, important financial decisions, not least among them about deciding about going to college or some post-secondary education and how to finance that. You've heard recently that President Obama highlighted the issue of college costs uh, and equipping students with the knowledge and the tools to make informed decisions uh, has never been more important. And you'll certainly hear more about that kind of work uh, as the morning unfolds. Uh, I, the one housekeeping point I'd like to make is that we have a few slots open for people to sign up if you wanted to make some comments later on. I think in the back there's a sign-up sheet so you can make your way back there if you'd like. I'd like to turn now to our first speaker uh, and someone who doesn't need any introduction, certainly in this room, but for the benefit of those folks who I think are watching us online, I'll give a brief little overview. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Chancellor Blank, the current uh, Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin at Madison and former acting U.S. Secretary of Commerce. Prior to arriving at Commerce, Dr. Blank was the Robert S. Kerr Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution and the Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. From 1997 to 99, Dr. Blank was one of three members of President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors. Dr. Blank has researched extensively on the interactions of the macro economy, government social policy programs, and the behavior of well behavior and well-being of families. A native of Missouri, uh, Dr. Blank is a graduate of the University of Minnesota and holds a PhD in economics from MIT. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, David. And thank you all for being here this morning. It looks like an absolutely great program. I also want to thank Deputy Secretary Coity and Director Cordray for coming, as well as David. Um, it's great to have partners um, with the federal government, and this is an issue that I know all of their agencies are concerned with, and hopefully we can have a good conversation about how policy might be able to move forward on, on some of the issues that we're going to discuss today. So as some of you know, I care a great deal about the topic of today's hearing and about the ways in which we can deepen the options available to help individuals and families be more effective financial decision makers. Michael Barr, um, who was a treasury for a number of years but is now at the law school at the University of Michigan, and I published a book four years ago called Insufficient Funds in which we discussed some of the reasons why individuals make short-term financial decisions that may result in very serious long-term consequences. Students, of course, are one of the groups at risk of getting into financial problems because they make difficult decisions at a relatively young age that can impact their financial lives for years to come. Now, since I was last working on this topic, I've um, changed jobs a couple of times, actually, and I'm now here at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and I'm very proud that I am at a university that has long been a leader in consumer financial education and research. And um, I want to thank Dean Shin, who um, has really helped create that at the School of Human Ecology. A primary example is the work being done at the Center for Financial Security, which is the, um, the host of today's program, housed at the School of Human Ecology. The center is an applied multidisciplinary research center that seeks to inform practitioners, policymakers, and the general public on strategies for building a lifetime of financial capability and security. Professor Michael Collins has been an excellent leader of this center and has helped fund it and shape it, shaping an exciting and an important research and an outreach and agenda. 
The center is a hub for interdisciplinary conversations with more than 50 research affiliates and fellows from a wide range of departments at the University of Wisconsin as well as across the nation. It hosts webinar series, which has a lot of participation on topics including such things as payday lending or the Wisconsin Poverty Report. And locally, the center supports students to work at a volunteer tax preparation site for low-income people here in Madison. Uh, the center's hosted training sessions for the past year statewide, reaching 90 social workers to help them educate and improve the financial capabilities of their own clients. And nationally, the center's quarterly financial coaching newsletter reaches more than 800 financial coaches and counselors. As a world-class leader in education and research, the University of Wisconsin works to prepare our students for life after they graduate. Um, financial capability, financial good decision making is an essential tool for each of our students, whether they end up as singers or as scientists. Faculty and staff at the University of Wisconsin have been exploring a range of financial education strategies, including online courses, financial clinics, and peer-to-peer -peer counseling. Our goal is to educate students on this topic. For our younger students, beginning with freshman orientation, we want our undergraduates to think about the consequences of charging the next pizza to a credit card. For our older students, we need to help graduating professionals navigate their employment and benefits packages and create a plan for managing their student loan payments. It's a big job, particularly when you look at the range of students and financial issues that confront people at an institution as large as the University of Wisconsin but it's one to which all educational institutions need to be committed. So today is an opportunity to learn from each other, to share our stories of success, to identify areas where we can improve the delivery of financial education and related services. For instance, one issue that I've asked about among my senior staff since starting this job two months ago is whether we can better identify the characteristics of students who are most likely to take on excessive debt or get in financial trouble while they're in school? The answer is we don't actually have the data to do that. We have aggregate data on debt burdens, but we don't have the micro data. And my staff are looking at are there some ways that we can disaggregate the data to look at that. I want to be able to target educational assistance more effectively. And I'd love to see research that better identifies how we can do that. So it's just a fact of life that many college graduates are going to take on debt to graduate are going to deal with some pretty complex financial issues while they're here in school and will enter the workforce with student loans. These students and their families worry about what jobs they're going to get. They worry about paying back those loans. They worry about their financial future. We need to be partners with these students and with their families in helping them make well-informed decisions. And we need to make sure that the financial institutions that they interact with will provide full and accurate information about the options and the consequences of different choices. So I'm very proud that the University of Wisconsin is hosting this discussion. I very again want to thank those who've come from out of town to be part of this, and I look forward to continuing the conversation beyond today. I'm going to apologize because I'm supposed to be somewhere at 9 o'clock, and I told them I'd be a little late. Um, but I'm going to talk and run, which is never good. But I am hoping to hear about the results of this conversation from Michael, from Soyen, from others as to you know, how does the day go and what are the ideas that have come forward. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mayor Paul Soglin, um, a U University of Wisconsin graduate who has served as Madison's mayor three separate times during three different decades. Madison is often recognized nationally as a great place to live, both for its scenic beauty and culture, as well as to being home to our world-class university and a lot of career opportunities. A vibrant, healthy city and a local economy, as many of you know, is not just an accident. It requires good and strong leadership, and Madison has been very fortunate to have Mayor Soglin at the helm. Mayor Soglin, thank you for being here. Thank you, Chancellor Blank, and, and just thank all of you for being here today. Yes, I, I did spend uh, 10 years as a student at the University of Wisconsin, <laughs> uh, undergraduate, graduate, and law school. It was a marvelous experience, obviously. Um, I had a couple of scholarships. I worked summers, even Christmas vacations. Um, and then there were the student loans. And after those 10 years, I had them all paid off 
within four years of graduating from law school. How many students today who work just as hard, who I think are academically superior uh, to my adventure, can say that they will be able to pay off their student loans within four years of graduating? I have three daughters, and so this matter is, is personally very important to me. Uh, all three of them have completed uh, an aggregate of, I guess we're working on 14 years of college right now. And um, the oldest, Rachel, uh, a graduate of the University of Michigan, out-of-state tuition, four years of undergraduate were $160,000. And you can imagine the, the size of the student loans, even with the considerable amount of cash that we put up front and uh, the scholarships that she received. And she's got two siblings who followed behind. I'm concerned about this not just from the standpoint of being a parent. I'm concerned about it from the standpoint of being a citizen and being the mayor. In my past experiences in between these stints of mayor, as mayor, I've worked in a number of areas and I want to just touch on them for a moment and then come back to the, to the students in this short uh, welcome that I've got. We did some research on, on jobs uh, a couple of years ago and we were doing some analysis about placement and we found a, a young man who had successfully finished high school, gone on to junior college and was now gainfully employed. He had celebrated the anniversary of his first year of employment having purchased the used pickup truck that he'd always dreamed of for $7,000. Consumer Reports it said it was a great buy. He got a great price on it. And he was not quite understanding as to why he was greeted with doubt when he shared the 17% interest rate that he was paying for the vehicle with his friends and family. Obviously, someone was in need of education. Then, in the work that I did in housing, and this is, ties into to the real point I want to make uh, today, and I hope you address this, this issue. We've got a housing crisis in this country. We are beginning to come out of it. There is a lot of blame going around as to what caused it. But one of the reasons the recovery is so slow is we do not have a significant cadre of young families moving into the housing market to purchase what is available. These are young families with a great credit history. They've paid their bills on time. They are employed. But when the numbers are run, the FICO scores are tabulated, someone determines that because of the size of the debt of the student loan, they cannot qualify for a mortgage. The burden, the burden of that loan is not only carried by the students, but it's carried by the rest of us in terms of the desire for a robust and healthy economy, for a robust and healthy community, because we want those homes filled with young families that have a future. Part of it is the responsibility of the individual in terms of managing debt, but part of it is our becoming creative in finding ways of paying for that college education and doing it in a reasonable fashion. Unfortunately, and I've filled out enough FAFSA forms, Unfortunately, too many students qualify for too many loans that do not support the education they pursue. This is not an indictment of the education. Coming out of college and making thirty-five, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in education, in social service, in dedicating oneself to bettering our community is a admirable, honorable, and reasonable goal. 
but those young people should not be strapped for an excess of cost of their education that benefits all of us. We must deal with the issue of the responsibility of the individual to manage their funds, but we also have to address the larger question of this, this responsibility for the cost of education. It is a pleasure to, to have uh, Richard Condray here today, and it's now my pleasure uh, to introduce, I love long titles, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce Policy at the United States Treasury Department, uh, Melissa Coity. So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Mayor Soglin. I mean, I'm. I can't help but sort of pause because I'm a mom of three young sons. Um, to introduce the personal story here, uh, very young sons, and frankly, I'm one of those students who is still paying my student loan debt. You know, professional, but still paying my own personal student loan debt, but thinking about what's the world going to look like for my kids, and frankly, how are we going to afford it? So thanks for the personal insights. It's important to bring it back to our own experiences at times, too. It really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, many thanks to the University of Wisconsin, uh, the work of the Center for Financial Stability, Security, um, and really thank you to Director Cordray for saying, let's get out of DC and let's get out and hear from people around the country and hear what they're doing to really address the issues of educating our young people. So on behalf of Secretary Liu, as you hear, I'm pleased to be here. I know that he would like to be here because this is a critical topic and I know it's important to him and my colleagues at the Treasury Department and that is helping young Americans get a solid financial footing under them and really understand how to manage and make decisions about where to go to school, how to pay for it and how to manage that debt when they come out. Improving financial capability is not going to have uh, a positive impact on those individuals and those families but ultimately, I think, as we all recognize, on the economic health of our country. Our communities are stronger when individuals and families have the skills, the insights, and the information they need to be making informed decisions, both in the short term and also for longer term goals. It's worth pausing. We are all making financial choices every single day. Should I cook in? Should I go out to eat? Should I be auto paying for my cell phone bill? I could go on and on about the cell phone bill. <laughs> These decisions, we all realize, feel really mundane, but they, they do add up to significant cost. But there are also times in our lives when big financial decisions, such as deciding whether or not to pursue higher education, and if so, when, where, and how to pay for it, are, are substantial. For many young people, paying for college is the first time they may be encountering these big decisions. It may be the first times that they're hearing about the words loan servicers or interest rate. The decisions are not simple and the impacts are significant and we're going to hear a lot about that today. We are convening this meeting uh, as the Financial Literacy and Education Commission which is, for a bit of background, comprised of 22 federal agencies with the broad purpose of improving Americans' financial knowledge. The commission was chartered by Congress to coordinate the activities across the federal government and to work with partners like many of you in this room across the country. On behalf of Secretary Liu, the Department of Treasury is pleased to chair the commission and work very closely with Director Cordray and his team at the CFPB. Over the past year, the commission has focused on identifying strategies to help younger Americans establish strong financial habits and the platform and the focus of our work is really about starting early and helping young people manage for financial success. Young adults today are in a more challenging financial position than earlier generations. In particular, many young adults have high levels of debt and fewer financial assets, putting them on a much rockier path than prior generations. Today's young adults are finding it more difficult, as we all realize, to get a firm financial footing and to start building for a strong financial future by investing in a home 
we're beginning to save for short-term goals, but also longer-term retirement. Evidence shows that many young people lack the financial knowledge needed to make some of these decisions. Last year's National Financial Capability Study found that young adults answered fewer questions correctly about basic financial concepts than older cohorts who were asked the same questions. The challenges young Americans face were perhaps best reflected in the self-assessment of their financial skills. Only 30% of young adults rated their financial skills as very strong. 70% were going in the other direction. The survey also found that only 36% of young adults, age 18 to 34, had been offered financial education, and only 22% had actually taken a financial education course. Yet these young people surveyed recognize the value of early financial education. Nearly 86% of them agreed that financial education should be taught in schools. There is an important opportunity, and in fact, I think an imperative, that we're reaching young people by starting early with financial education. The benefits of doing so can last a lifetime. We know that creating retirement accounts early in life and allowing an individual to begin saving and allow that savings to grow and accumulate can lead to financial stability over the long term. Likewise, research tells us that individuals who have a savings account in their own name as children are more likely to finish college, leading to a more financially secure future. And children whose parents are teaching them about financial topics early in life are more likely to have a positive financial outcome into adulthood such as higher credit scores and lower credit card debt. Our Starting Early for Financial Success agenda is intended to harness the collective energy and resources of the Commission member agencies. The Commission is using this framework to reach Americans of all ages. We're looking and focusing our efforts at toddlers, at kindergartners, high schoolers, college kids and vocational students, as well as young adults who are just starting their careers. So let me give you a few examples of some of the work that's happening by the federal government in this respect. Um, given the evidence that saving, that a savings account in a child's name can help to lead to longer term financial stability and uh, help children become more prepared for getting into college, this is not especially sexy, but it's really important work. We're working to make it simpler for financial institutions to be able to open up accounts in the names of children. There are a lot of thorny regulations related to those types of issues. And solving even some of those minor friction points we think can have real value for helping to get savings happening earlier for kids. We are also including financial education and access to appropriate financial products for young people who are entering summer job programs so that they can build stronger practices that we anticipate will stay with them throughout their lives. We are also testing new approaches for providing financial education in the workplace for employees early in their careers to begin saving early. And of interest to many in this room and, and relevant for our conversation today, we are working to ensure that students get clear and useful information about paying for post-secondary education, preparing for graduation, and managing that debt once they're coming out. We are also working to make sure that federal student loan borrowers are taking advantage of a really powerful program, the income-based repayment program options. These programs, um, we need to communicate more widely and more effectively about the opportunity for participating in these programs, but they can have tremendous benefit for helping students, particularly those who are struggling with finding employment, manage that monthly student loan payment. So that is a big agenda for all of us. President Obama has expanded the availability of education grants and affordable loans through federal financial aid, including an unprecedented expansion of Pell Grants, which are helping millions of Americans go to college. However, there is more to do to help students and their families use these options wisely and make more inf informed choices about higher education. So today, we're eager to hear from you. We're eager to hear your input. What are you doing? What are you as practitioners who are helping young people navigate the space? What are you telling the kids? How are you helping them think about their finances in the immediate term and the long term? 
We're going to have presentations uh, this morning from two panels of researchers and practitioners who are providing financial education for, for young people across the region. There will be an opportunity, I believe, to hear directly from audience members as well. So I'm looking forward to learning from you. I know my colleagues are as well. And I'd now like to introduce you to Director Cordray. Director Cordray is the uh, lead of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and he serves as the first director of that federal agency. He previously led the Bureau's Enforcement Division, and immediately before that, Director Cordray served as Attorney General of Ohio. Prior to his tenure as Attorney General, Dr. Director Cordray spent two years as Ohio State Treasurer. So please uh, join me in welcoming Director Cordray. Thank you, Melissa. One of, one of the happy incidents of uh, working anywhere is you find colleagues uh, that you enjoy working with and respect, and I have tremendously enjoyed uh, working with uh, Assistant Deputy Secretary Coity on the Financial Literacy Education Commission. And she was enthusiastic when I suggested we, uh, as she said, get out of the beltway and uh, take this message uh, around the country, and that's what we're determined uh, to do. Uh, thank you also to Mayor Soglin, uh, Chancellor Blank, and the team at the Senator for Financial Security for helping us plan this event. Uh, I'm grateful for the warm uh, Badger Country welcome, given that in three days Wisconsin plays Ohio State in Columbus. I grew up uh, not far from there, and I still commute from my hometown in central Ohio to Washington. So out of sensitivity to my host, I'll make no predictions about the outcome of Saturday's game but I'll be watching with interest. As Vice Chair of the Financial Literacy and Education Commission, uh, I'm pleased to join my colleagues in welcoming uh, all the educators and experts uh, in the audience. It's also nice to see many student advocates in the room, including Wisconsin PERG, which hosted our student loan ombudsman, Rohit Chopra, at a campus event last year. We're keenly interested to hear from the students here about how we can do a better job helping them navigate a financial world whose increasing complexity holds a key to their and our future. Aristotle said, the neglect of education does harm to the political order. Although he made that observation more than 2,000 years ago, it still rings true today, especially on a campus as respected and admired as the one here in Madison. And as everyone in the room knows, the neglect of financial education can certainly undermine progress in any nation organized around a free market and founded on a regime of personal responsibility, as is true in the United States. Yet Americans have neglected this important matter. There's no doubt about it. We see it every day in the personal struggles of individuals and families. We see it more broadly across entire communities that are still digging through the residue of the recent financial crisis. Many consumers make bad decisions because they do not understand their choices or they simply do not know any better and some unscrupulous businesses take full advantage of those consumers. At the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we're deeply committed to a vision of an America where everyone is financially educated and financially capable. I was just in the Mississippi Delta last week, the birthplace of B.B. King. He once said, the beautiful thing about learning is that nobody can take it away from you. Likewise, at the Consumer Bureau, we believe that financial education is the key to individual empowerment. Because when it comes to financial matters, the hard truth is nobody cares as much about you as you care about yourself. Nobody understands your needs and wants, your hopes and dreams, as well as you understand them yourself. So everyone must recognize that at a very fundamental level, I am my own first line of consumer protection. But the challenges that confront us in achieving this goal of financial capability are complex, varied, and significant. To overcome them, we must start early. We must start where good education always starts with our children. If we intend to foster and maintain the kind of society in which all Americans are able to enjoy the blessings of liberty that they're promised under our Constitution by controlling the direction of their lives, then we must make it a point to arm our fellow citizens with the wherewithal to stand on their own two feet and make sustainable economic choices. Financial education should be as fundamental 
as the education we're all required to receive in U.S. history and government. Within the framework of our republic, we built the greatest system of economic liberty in the history of mankind. Yet it will only endure if we take the steps necessary to strengthen that system from the bottom up, starting with the individual. The financial services marketplace is constantly evolving in complex ways, and managing one's finances is a lifelong endeavor. To this end, teaching kids about money should not be reserved to a few games of family night monopoly, where children are taught the benefits of buying up boardwalk and park place, although it is a winning strategy. <laughs> Parents need to be engaged as their children are learning to master the concepts of personal financial management. Children form their financial identities early, and so it's important for parents to talk to their children about money at an early age. But we also need to face the hard reality it's probably unrealistic at the outset to think that we can count on these matters to be taught successfully in the home. For many families, personal finances are a taboo subject, a source of friction and anxiety that parents often strive to keep hidden from their children. Moreover, the mass, vast majority of parents have little background on these matters other than what they've derived from their some, own sometimes difficult experiences and they lack the confidence to impart lessons to anyone else. Whenever I've been involved in financial education programs in the classroom, invariably we hear later from some of the children that their parents wondered where they could find similar lessons for themselves. So we must start by filling this gap and being more deliberate about pursuing financial education in our schools. Failure to do this condemns boys and girls to make the same mistakes others have made before them by enrolling them in the school of hard knocks. This phrase is a facetious one, of course, reflecting that this is no school at all, but just an unsatisfactory place where people will keep on making the same mistakes others made before them with the same poor results and the same lasting regrets. Everyone sees this when they focus on what they see around them, yet it is now 2013 and still many states have no requirement at all to ensure that their young people receive such instruction. To put the matter simply, that has to change. It is unconscionable and indefensible that we seem so content to do a lousy job on these matters of such undeniable importance. Earlier this year, the Consumer Bureau published a report that assembled and synthesized all the best thinking we could find thinking that we share with many of you in this room on how these issues should be addressed in K-12 education. To start with, we strongly recommended that financial education must start early and must be continuous. We need to develop integrated curricula in our schools where the benefits of compound interest are understood in math class, where economic costs and risks are taught in social studies class, and where essays in English class include topics involving money, what it is, how it's evolved, how we use it, how we keep it safe. None of this distracts one whit from the classroom agenda. It's an important point. In fact, children pay more attention and get more engaged with things that interest them. And when it comes to money, young people definitely get it. Almost universally, they view money as fascinating and important. We also suggested as part of, that part of the answer is to incorporate financial concepts into standardized tests that states already administer. Indeed, many tests around the country already incorporate some real-life examples of money management or economic decision-making, but we could do much more. Whatever is on the standardized tests will heavily influence what's taught in the classroom. And by the way, if you look back at math textbooks from a century ago, one of, the, one of your peers in this field uh, reminded me of this, and I went online and bought a few, you find that they contained extensive discussion around financial choices, how to construct a budget, and the like. We need to regain that common sense focus on how the things we're learning relate directly to our everyday financial lives, which need not be difficult to do. Many of you see how students begin their economic lives in earnest uh, in high school. Regardless of whether they're earning money at their first job, as I did, McDonald's, when I was in high school, figuring out how to pay for gas or go out with their friends, or building a college savings account, people begin to experience financial life while they're still fairly young and often well before they go out formally on their own. These students are more likely to retain financial knowledge when they apply financial concepts to what's actually happening in their lives right then and right there. We must capitalize on these teachable moments and personal situations. Experiential learning can be a very effective way to approach financial education with the young people of this generation. Hands-on efforts such as school bank programs, entrepreneurship training, and games or other forms of simulations can help students deepen their financial knowledge and build financial capability as the first panel in this hearing 
will explore. And the threshold of adulthood is exactly the right time to look, lock in the commitment and the know-how to lead purposeful economic lives. To borrow a phrase we'll be using along this spectrum, young people need to be convinced of the importance of friending your future self by making sound and sustainable financial decisions that they can live with over time. At the Consumer Bureau, we also believe it's critical to support teachers and schools with the training that's needed to deliver sound financial instruction to students. Those efforts do not have to be expensive. There are many creative opportunities, as I saw in Ohio. But we do need to support those who need and want to know more. Good training programs will help them gain the confidence to deal with the issues raised by an increasingly complex financial marketplace that American households must now deal with every day. And my own experience with teacher training in Ohio made clear that bringing together people who are passionate about financial education generates its own energy and infectious enthusiasm and leads to relationships and cross-pollination that spawn new and unforeseen ideas about how to reach students most effectively. Our second panel today focuses on preparing post-secondary students to attain financial independence. The mayor spoke eloquently about this, as did Melissa a moment ago. Uh, I have two children myself. Each of them has three. That's an economic decision, by the way. Uh, many parents feel pressure to send their child to the best school possible, often making the decision based on rankings and other factors that ignore or discount the true cost of an education. The Consumer Bureau's Paying for College suite of tools, available on our website at consumerfinance.gov, is designed to help families consider their options and assess the costs and risks in terms that are easier to understand. These tools show students their monthly debt payment at graduation. They help students weigh the burden posed by the projected debt load based on the nationwide average starting salary of a new graduate. In short, they help students and families who may be facing this intimidating challenge for the first time in their lives to ask the right questions so that they can make more informed and hard-headed decisions. Equally important, the Paying for College tool set encourages the type of purposeful planning about financial choices that we believe is critical to building up financial capabilities. These are skills that benefit students not just in post-secondary education, but throughout their entire life. To construct a more financially capable America, we must develop a knowledge base that gets passed on to others in a more rigorous and systematic way. Fashioning bridges of experience between peoples is the mark of all great societies. Building upon what others have done is a hallmark of civilization and the primary means of improving life for the next generation. Nowhere is that more necessary and more justified than in the field of financial education. Up to now, we have fallen woefully short. But I'm certain that we can and will do better by focusing our efforts on three items. The first is basic financial literacy, understanding the tools that are the building blocks of financial life for American consumers today, such as budgeting, banking account products, credit cards, credit reports, and the like. Second is an awareness of certain everyday choices which create incremental changes in your life that loom larger with the passage of time, such as efforts to save money consistently and to prepare for retirement. Third is a recognition that many miss that some major decisions are so crucial in their own right that they can affect the entire trajectory of your life, such as decisions about paying for further education or decisions about buying a home. If you handle these major life decisions correctly, you will likely prosper. If you handle them poorly, you will multiply your troubles or perhaps run aground altogether. The Consumer Bureau will increasingly come to serve as an impartial, agenda-free, neutral source of expert advice on all these fronts for American consumers to rely on as they manage their affairs. I know that many of you in this room have dedicated decades of your lives to delivering on this promise. Wisconsin is, in fact, one of the few states with an Office of Financial Education, so we know people here understand the need and truly care about meeting it. Uh, I like to quote Justice Brandeis, who not only was a Supreme Court Justice, but was the original consumer advocate. He once said that one of the happy incidents of a Federalist system uh, is that states are laboratories of democracy. They can experiment with new approaches to problems. Nowhere has that uh, concept been embraced uh, as effectively and consistently as here in the state of Wisconsin. So we applaud your efforts and we want you to know that our fellow commission members and I are standing alongside you. To help enable this collaborative effort, the Consumer Bureau just launched an online learning community on K-12 educators on LinkedIn. We organized this growing forum to share best practices and ideas and we invite you to join us as well. 
As we listen to the wealth of expertise on these panels today, I want to leave you with one last thought. Our schools do so many things. They foster community service and a love for the arts, as well as an appreciation for teamwork and athletic achievement. And despite some of the metrics that show us lagging behind internationally in some categories, America's schools still produce a great workforce as well as some of the best minds in the world. We have dedicated, passionate teachers in this country, and each one of us can recall many teachers as formative, positive influences on our lives. I know that I can. Financial education over the vast expanse of this country is a daunting challenge, but is one we know we can master if we simply have the will to stick with it. I saw in the Wisconsin state flag a good slogan for our efforts, forward. Simple slogan, but a good one. It's inspiring to know that so many of you share this conviction, and I look forward to today's discussions with all of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Director Cordray. Um, we're now going to turn to some of the experts and practitioners in the field uh, who are doing some of this very important work. Uh, to lead us off, I think I'm going to introduce Michael Collins, who is the director here um, of the Center for Financial Security. And we'll again thank you for hosting us. Um, Dr. Collins studies consumer decision making in the financial marketplace, uh, including the role of public policy in influencing credit, savings, and investment choices. And I think you will give us an overview of some of the panelists as well. So thank you. I want to echo everyone else's thanks for prior speakers and the organizers and for all of you for being here today. It's um, really quite an honor to have DC come to us for a change because usually we have to go there. So for those of you who have flight troubles later today, well, this is a little payback for the trips that we've had today. <laughs> um, imagine this in February with you know, four feet of snow on the ground and you'll get a sense of it. Um, so again, thank you all for being here. I, I think today is about hearing from, from you, hearing voices from students, hearing voices from educators, hearing voices from regulators, from, from people in the public sector, and also from parents. And actually, you've noted almost everyone up here has made that comment about being a parent. Um, so last night I was preparing for today and telling my wife a little bit what we were doing. And I, like Melissa, have a, have a five-year-old. And my five-year-old was asking, what, can, what should I draw, Mom? And she sort of facetiously said, why don't you draw financial capability, you know, sort of snarkily to my daughter and looking at me. Um, so my daughter did. And so she drew a picture of a piggy bank with some coins going in. And then the coins coming out of the piggy bank and then two people at a store one had an X to them, the other one was buying something. And so I asked, okay, what, what does this mean? And she's, well, the pennies are going in the bank, but they're there for a purpose. There's a reason that they're there, and they're there for them to go to the store, but they have to make the right decision about what they're going to buy. Are they going to buy this thing or that thing? And I thought, nailed it. I mean, that's pretty much, pretty much it. Uh, you know, spending choices, pennies for a purpose. You have to have pennies. You have to have a bank. So there's, you know, there's some, some neat pieces of this that make sense. Um, this whole idea of financial capability, I think, is evolving over time as we understand the field better. Um, we know that it's more than just having knowledge. It's knowing, it's doing, and it's adapting. You know, if you think about the piggy bank that maybe we had as kids, I mean, our, our kids, may, kids may, this may be the piggy bank. I mean, we may be moving to a world that um, the adaptability becomes uh, very important. And it's getting more complex. When, you know, over two decades ago when I was in college, we didn't check our credit reports because I'm not sure we had that mechanism. So, uh, we, you know, we know that the world is changing very much. Um, so I think these two panels today are helping us to, to get a, um, a viewpoint for the voices that we're going to hear from students, from parents, uh, and from educators. Um, the first panel talking about youth experiential education. So that idea of combining skills and knowledge and attitudes, helping very young people um, begin to think about what is the role of banking of financial services in my life? How do I make these choices? What are the tools that help me make these decisions? Understanding that learning styles vary. They vary across different kinds of students, different kinds of contexts. Some students are much more visual, much more engaged with technology. Um, in other cases, we use simulations or we integrate the education into other subjects. Um, the challenges are significant. Uh, uh, Wendy Way, who's here, and Carton Holden have done some work in the past on um, teachers' own preparation to be engaged in these topics, and many aren't that comfortable with that topic. It's not something that's been um, integrated into the curriculum um, and that students, and um, particularly their teachers, have been well prepared for. Um, but it's a topic that both schools, parents, and educators are eager for, so we have some opportunities going forward. Um, we also have to think about the other um, 
the other systems that are supportive of young people, uh, be those libraries and librarians. We've had some researchers here in that area who have really looked at the important role that librarians play in this space. Or community-based organizations, nonprofits, uh, boys and girls clubs, other kinds of institutions um, that are engaged with kids. One thing about financial education that we think about when we focus on this youth market is it's not about individual decision makers. It's about an individual in the context of their family, of their parents, of their peers, of the social institutions that are available to them, the financial institutions that are available to them. This is very much a we're in this together kind of decision when we focus on this particular point of the market. Um, so going back to this pennies for a purpose metaphor, the second panel is going to think more about post-secondary uh, education and the role of financial education for that market. Um, it's striking when you look at the data, the difference between the net wealth of people with some college, at least one year of college education relative to high school. Um, it's about four and a half times more net wealth by the time they get to those peak wealthy years of 52 to 66. Four times, the median is four times greater for people who've had some college, at least one year of college. College has a great payback. It has a great payback in lots of ways, intellectually, socially, uh, income-wise. Um, but it's not cheap, it's not free. For most students, there is a cost. And so how do you make these trade-offs about how much to invest, how much equity to invest, how much debt do I invest? This idea of pennies for a purpose. What am I buying and, and what's my goal? Um, the other thing about college is it's a transition. It's when we learn about a lot of things, you know, including um, how to be a, a, a grown-up. Uh, and part of that involves how do I manage my money? How do I break the, purse, the, the, the strings from uh, the purse strings from my parents? Um, so I'm making simultaneously decisions about my future, investing in my future human capital, and I'm trying to figure out how to pay for that pizza. Um, it's a lot, a lot going on for students. Um, the family context really matters, and I think we oftentimes rely on rules of thumb, and we'll hear, I think, about some of those today, um, simple rules of thumb, uh, which oftentimes get most people pretty far, but we also recognize that there are exceptions to the rules. And one size fits all oftentimes means that many are left behind. Uh, so as we think about these panels today, uh, I want us to be optimistic. There are great opportunities going forward. There's great energy. There's great leadership. We've got breakthrough research. We've got great examples of, of the kind of work that we're going to hear from today, um, but also humble. Uh, we've got a rapidly changing market. We've got a lot of demands on time. We've got stressed economic situations. Uh, and so we have to sort of keep these, these tensions in mind as we go forward. Um, so I thank you all for being here today. I want to go ahead and welcome the, the first panel on up. Uh, and we'll go from there. Well, and as the panelists are coming up, my name is Dave Mansell. I'm the director of Wisconsin's Office of Financial Literacy, which is at the Department of Financial Institutions. And I was reminded when uh, Professor Collins uh, talked about his daughter with a picture, the first time I was at a FLEC event and presented at it, I, I did go to Washington, D.C., and I brought my daughter, who was six at the time, and I used her as a prop, and she didn't want to have to come up to the podium, but uh, she had just uh, recently lost a tooth, and so the tooth fairy came and, and provided uh, something under her pillow, and that became a teachable moment for personal finance, and so now she's 14, and I just dropped her off at uh, swimming this morning, uh, and here we are, fast forward into the future, uh, talking about financial literacy once again. Uh, we saw, uh, or we're seeing in the United States a growing trend in financial literacy education, albeit slow for a lot of us. Uh, each year and over the decades we have seen states uh, uh, incorporate requirements uh, for personal finance uh, literacy. We've seen incorporation in different ways, uh, not necessarily a requirement, uh, but in other ways that schools are adopting and states are adopting financial education. In Wisconsin, we just, uh, uh, we have a, for, first of all, we're a um, local control state. We have 424 school districts, and we just surveyed all those districts and released the data yesterday, and we discovered that in Wisconsin, there's 49% 40, uh, of school districts with high schools uh, have a requirement. Just two years ago, that number was at 25%. So we're seeing some growth right here in, in our state. Uh, so as interest in teaching financial literacy grows, so does the need to provide tangible opportunities for students to develop positive skills and habits. Financial education is sort of like health education. In health education, uh, it's not enough to just know that you're supposed to eat right and exercise and then take a, you know, be able to answer the, the written test. In health education, 
You have to do the activity. You have to eat right. You have to exercise to get the benefit. And that's the same with personal finance. So in uh, personal finance, there are many opportunities for experiential hands-on learning, uh, such as uh, Director Cordray mentioned, financial institutions hosting branches in schools, uh, simulation programs like Reality Check or Reality Store. There's online simulations. There's online video contests like IOMe, which was developed in Green Bay. Um, so experiential learning does have its challenges, though. Um, engaging outside, um, outside of school districts, uh, partners, uh, how do you do that? How do you measure a student's knowledge gain, or especially uh, measuring improved behavioral changes of the students? So we're lucky today to have our panelists uh, who will uh, come from a diverse background and experiences, and uh, they'll provide us insights to opportunities and best practices for using experiential learning to help youth increase their financial literacy. So joining us today, we have Alex Martinez. Uh, he's with uh, Chippewa Valley Tech College. Uh, he's also a student who participated in a credit union branch in a school. Uh, we have Jennifer Block with Royal Credit Union, uh, who also serves as an appointee on the Governor's Council on Financial Literacy. Uh, we have Elizabeth Otters-White. Uh, she is the U.S. Bank Professor at UW-Madison School of Business, and she's also an affiliate researcher at the Center for Financial Security. And then Lois Kitch, uh, she is the National Program Manager of the Real Solutions Program uh, with the National Credit Union Foundation. So uh, in Wisconsin at our Office of Financial Literacy, we've seen over the years schools adopting more and more experiential type uh, programs, especially the Reality Store or Reality Check simulation. In fact, over half in our survey we discovered over half of our schools are using that type of simulation already. So it's, it's a very interesting to have this panel, and I'm per personally interested to hear uh, what we can learn uh, from the panel. So let's get started. Uh, maybe uh, Jennifer and, and Lois, maybe you could help us with a, gathering a clear understanding of what experiential learning is and how this strategy can help students. So Jennifer or Lois, if you'd like to comment on that. Sure. Uh, well, at Royal Credit Union, we believe that great savings habits start at a young age. And we opened our first Save at School program in 1993, and we haven't looked back. We'll be opening our 27th uh, school site next month. Uh, we're in 17 elementary schools, five middle schools, and five high schools. And it really is a traditional Save at School program. Little kids come with their super saver pouchers at the elementary level once a week. Uh, sometimes with a quarter, sometimes with a penny. We don't care how much it is, it's just to get them into the habit of saving. Obviously, when we move on to our middle school and high school programs, um, they're much more complex. At the high school level, the students are actual Royal Credit Union employees. They go through all of our training, we pay them. Uh, they work in our school branches and also in our freestanding branches. So they are a part of our team. They also do peer-to-peer -peer education. So they, we teach them things about how to save for college and basics of investments, and they teach those to their fellow students. Of course, we have to offer free food to get them to come sometimes, um, but certainly the program works very well and we're very proud of it. So good morning. Um, my name is Lois Kitch. I'm with the National Credit Union Foundation, and we do a whole host of experiential learning programs for students all the way through adults, uh, simulations, um, learning maps, retirement fairs, but today I'm here to talk to you about a reality fair program. So a financial reality fair is a two and a half hour exercise that's geared toward high school and uh, junior high school students. And it's basically designed to help students understand what it's like to li live the life of a 25 year old, which isn't so far in the future, but it's a, it's a very long way from where they are in high school. So the program actually starts before they come to the fair when they actually pick out a career that they're interested in pursuing and then determine the salary level for that career. Imagine how surprised they are when they find out an actress in DC actually earns $22,000 a year, not the $25 million they were anticipating. <laughs> Once they actually get to the fair, the fair is held in a large space, an auditorium, a football arena, I mean a football field, all kinds of places. And when the students arrive, it can be as many as 50 students all the way to 600 students participating in a single fair. 
they will come in, receive a budget sheet that will help them understand what it's like to budget. The budget sheet will have deductions for student loans. It will have deductions for taxes already incorporated into their monthly take-home pay. That's a surprising number for many of them. What they'll then do is work through a fair, a series of booths that are manned by volunteers that are experts in a specific field. So they'll, they'll visit the basic booths first, like housing, food, clothing, transportation. And they'll make decisions about how they want to live as that life as a 25-year-old. Now, you can't imagine how many Lamborghinis are actually bought by <laughs> high school students. They also go to temptation booths, which are fun to watch. Our counselors, our, our volunteers are trained to entice them to want the biggest and the best of everything. They get 60-inch TVs and the, the cell phone package that has all the bells and whistles, and they get concert tickets, and they go to Europe in their minds. They have the biggest and the best pets. All of the things that they need and all of the things that they think they need to live um, as an adult. So here's the key part. Once they have visited all of the booths, then they sit down with a financial counselor who starts to help them understand the difference between what they need and what they want. Suddenly they're riding the bus instead of driving that Lamborghini. They have, my favorite is, like, he was going to drive the Lamborghini, he was going to get married, and his wife was going to ride the bus. Which is not <laughs> sure that's actually going to work for you. Yeah. So they actually work through, the, the counselors work with them to understand the importance of savings and the importance of developing a savings habit, and that saving for one of these luxury items instead of trying to purchase it on time, how much more effective it is. So the, the students are actually learning by doing. Now, does it work? Well, one of my favorites, we just had a teacher that um, spent time with me at watching the fair happening with their students. And the teacher said to me, these students have learned more in the last two and a half hours with you than they did in a whole semester of classroom teaching with me. Which helped us realize it, that there is such a benefit to going through the exercise of learning instead of having someone talk at you to actually experience and make decisions yourself. So when they take back that television and have to pay a restocking fee to put it back on the shelf, there are implications in the decisions that they make. When the students go home, they say things like, life is harder than I thought. Say they, things like, um, I thought I would have a lot more money to spend and I couldn't buy a car until I got a part-time job. I learned that budgeting is harder than I thought. And consistently kids say to us, I'm gonna go home and say thank you to mom and dad because I had no idea that life was this hard. So experiential learning is taking the idea of learning by doing and it's successfully helping children understand the importance of the decisions that they make. Dave? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you touched on the fact that uh, there's a lot of impact with experiential learning over maybe sort of traditional lecture or, or that type of style. Uh, maybe, uh, Jennifer, could you comment on the impact you've seen uh, with your program? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's nothing like the kids being able to get right in there and do it. Um, we, over the past 20 years, have hired over 2,500 students. So even at the elementary level, we hire fourth and fifth grade students to work. And we line up at a table, much like this one. The first student is the greeter. They take the pouch. They count the money. They pass it down. One of the students is entering the information into our actual computer program uh, at the credit union. So obviously we have some adult supervision over that part. <laughs> um, and then we stamp their cards, print their receipts, hand it back to them. So the kids really are in the trenches doing the work. And then from the student perspective, they're, they're here. They're, they're with their pouches. They get to open up and see their receipts, see how their account grows. It's not somebody just standing up um, in front of them talking about it, they're actually doing it and watching their money grow. We encourage all of our students, savers, to set a goal. And we encourage them to set a realistic goal. Save for something that you can get in 
six months. What can that be? It might be a $2 item. It might be a $10 item. It might be a bicycle. We had a student the other week come back and he'd been saving for a bicycle for a year and he saved enough for the bike and the helmet too, as his mom told us. So it's just those stories um, that we hear from kids that we really know we're making a difference and we know we're making a difference because we're there with them, looking them in the eye face to face, doing the actual saving. Fantastic, Lois, I don't know if you wanted to add anything or? Well, I think it's, uh, I think that this is an opportunity that can be done by all sorts of organizations and that there is a lot of organizations out there to help you. So we really do encourage you. I have to admit, I got so engrossed in her story, I lost my train of thought. But <laughs> we really do encourage credit unions to take on and think about experiential learning programs. It's wonderful in Eau Claire, we do your program and we partner with the Chamber of Commerce. Fantastic. So many businesses in our communities are part. We have uh, realtors come and do the house part. Car dealers do the cars. I hand out the checkbooks. So um, it really is a business community. And that's what I think is so important in this. It's businesses partnering with education because we have the knowledge to share. The school district my kids go to have the same program. They call it reality days, but the same program. It's an outstanding program. It's very efficient. It is efficient and it is effective. Well, the <laughs> story I have was the young, several young women who went through the program and came out of it realizing that they didn't want to have children as soon as they graduate. Which is a life, you might not have heard, but they're, they're choosing when to even have children, understanding the impact that children have on your financial lives. So we've heard from some of the practitioners, but I think it's important to hear from a student who actually was involved with that. And so we have a student, Alex. Um, would you say that that's been a, a similar experience with you, or could you describe your experience? Uh, yeah, well, you know, hearing everybody talk about it is, is one thing, but actually going through it and being a part of it is a whole new experience. Um, I was I was in the uh, high school program through RCU and, and I've gone the, gone through the whole thing. I uh, started out as a junior and went went through high school and I continue to, to, to work at RCU today. And I've been in, in the programs that as she was just previously talking about, I've been there and I've done them and, and it's incredible. Um, when, when you're allowed to have the tools uh, in the state of Wisconsin to really further your financial learning, it does miracles. Um, personally, the financial stability that I've received at my age and doing what I do is, is incredible. It's, it's eye-opening. Being a full-time student, uh, being a full-time college student, and uh, being able to say, you know what, I don't have student debt yet because I'm still working, I'm, I'm still saving. Um, those, those ideas, they begin at the elementary school level. They, they begin throughout uh, a student's life, and they should continue into middle school and into high school. You, know, you, you get that increased work ethic and you get that increased financial literacy because the tools are given to you as a student and, and you get those hands-on experience where, like, like they're saying up here, you know, you, you can either get told to you or you can experience it. And when you experience that, that's when you really start to grow. And I personally have grown so much with those, with those tools that have been really given to me in the past few years through both uh, financials and through both programs. That, that have been around. That, that's an eloquent uh, testimonial, and thank you for that, Alex. Um, and, and thank you for the practitioners that have made these uh, opportunities possible. Um, looking at the context of, uh, you know, on a research or policy perspective, how else can we evaluate uh, programs like this? Elizabeth, could you comment on that? Sure, sure. So, you know, obviously there are so many wonderful programs that are happening. We've heard about two of them here. And, and, and again, anecdotal evidence, we have Alex right in front of us saying this was a life-changing experience. So I, I don't think any of us doubt the value of these programs. And yet, from a policy perspective, and we're talking about coordinated efforts moving forward, um, the bar is probably just a little bit higher. We'd like a little more data, a little more understanding, rigorous evaluation of, of the impacts of these programs. And so the great news is we have so many out there the, the maybe surprising news is that we don't have a lot of really formal, rigorous evaluation yet. So the opportunities are there, um, and it's sort of wide open. So I think that we want to approach it um, systematically and carefully, and in particular, we want to approach evaluation in a way that we can facilitate synthesis across different evaluations of different programs. So the question in my mind is not so much 
you know, does this particular program work with this particular group of students in this particular city, but sort of what are the underlying mechanisms that are at work here, and are those effective, right? Because then we can synthesize across programs, even if there's slight differences um, among them. I think part of the challenge, particularly when we're talking about youth, and especially if we're talking about very young people, like pre-K through five or eight, um, is that we have to clearly define what our objectives are, recognizing that the objectives are behavioral changes, or in that case, not even changes, but establishing positive behaviors that are going to occur sometimes 10 or 20 years down the road. So how do we evaluate in real time whether the program is doing what we want? And I think that entails thinking very carefully about what are some proxies that we can observe among fourth graders that are likely to indicate positive financial behaviors when they're into adulthood. So thinking needs to happen about that. Um, and, and again, to facilitate synthesis, I think we need studies to be very clear about what was the objective of the program and also the details of the implementation because we want to understand those differences in order to sort of tease out the common factors and really understand their impact. Um, the final thing I'll add is just having control groups is really critical, right? So if we look at pre-post and we see great changes, that's wonderful, but we really want to be able to compare it to what would have happened if they hadn't experienced the program. I think I'll stop with that. Yeah, no, fascinating, thank you. Um, and that kind of gets into uh, measurement. Uh, there could be some barriers in how we measure experiential learning. Uh, there's also uh, probably some overlooked challenges of implementing something like this. How do you bring in uh, outside uh, help uh, to a school district, that type of thing. Uh, maybe Jennifer or Los, you could comment on uh, challenges or barriers that you have encountered. Probably our biggest challenge is just getting kids enrolled in the program because we do have some barriers with kids opening account. A fourth grader can't walk up to the table and say, Jen, I want to open a savings account. We need parent, guardian, grown up at home is, is what we talk to the kids about because there's so many different situations but we need their consent to be able to do it so mm -hmm. my biggest challenge is getting to the kids and also I think um, the education teachers today as, as we learned Elizabeth don't always feel comfortable teaching the information so I think educating our teachers so that they can share it back up what we're doing is so important so those I would say are, are our two biggest challenges I think the challenge is around reality fairs. There's an interest in almost dichotomy in a sense that getting into the classroom the first time is very, very difficult. And it is because teachers are stretched. Many of them are teaching to a test that they really feel compelled to make sure that their students are ready to, com uh, to complete. Then there's the other side of it. Once the students start to attend a fair, they want to come back over and over again, and it's actually starting to meet the demand. So that's the better problem of the two, is actually having um, you know, more demand that we can actually um, accommodate. Another thing around experiential learning such as these, they're very time intensive to actually put on. It takes a great deal of volunteers. If you do a fair for 600 students, for example, you'll have 150 volunteers or more in the, in the room. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes it takes a big collaboration among many groups to actually make them work. There's also a financial reality to putting these on for the institutions that are actually running the fairs. You know, there is a cost per student that can range anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 dollars to put on a really effective fair. So the credit unions, many of them that we're working with, actually have fundraising strategies that they have <coughs> to raise the money to actually host the fairs and continue to move them forward. Fantastic. Um, so we, we've heard how outside uh, providers might come to schools um, and the work that uh, financial institutions have been doing, uh, which is commendable. Uh, schools have a tough job. Uh, you know, if you, they can only teach personal finance to a certain degree, have experiential learning, um, but then um, it, you go back home. And parents are the first teacher, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, of, of, stu of kids, right? So how do we engage parents or families uh, to be involved with this type of education? And anyone that feels uh, they want to speak first can do that, and please uh, speak close to the mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, I will talk from the perspective of the reality fairs. We make sure when the students leave the reality fair that they have a host of materials that they can share with their parents. 
Now we cannot guarantee that they actually do when they actually get home, but we, we make every effort that we can to make sure that the parents are involved, that the teachers are involved. We also have come to realize that experiential learning is a very effective teaching tool and that we kicked around the idea, if you can teach children through experiential learning, can you also make a difference with, with adults? So one of the areas we found that is sadly lacking is people getting ready for retirement. And if you look at, there's a vast array of statistics that say Americans are not prepared for retirement. So we developed a retirement fair geared towards adults to help them really understand how to prepare for retirement going from booth to booth, making life choices the same as the children did, and then determining how much money they would actually need to fund those life choices. Now we were geared towards young adults thinking they'd be madly interested in this, and of course they're madly interested in other things. We found the interest range from those that were 40 all the way to 65, people getting ready and starting to think about retirement. So effective learning, it can be done through um, all kinds and all, I mean, experiential learning is effective for all kinds and all ages. Can I just jump in and yes. say, um, so I, I think, and I don't remember which speaker mentioned earlier, I think it was Michael, that um, teachers sometimes don't feel comfortable with this material and therefore are hesitant to teach it. And I think, um, and, and maybe it was Melissa alluded, we, we have the same problem with parents and families as well. Um, and so I think one of the ways to get parents involved is, is to directly reach out to them and let them know that this is not that difficult. If you're talking about preschoolers, what do you need to communicate to them? And you actually can communicate things about financial well-being to preschoolers. It's wants versus needs. Bring them to the grocery store with you. Let's talk about we need to buy milk. We want ice cream, right? So I think part of it is just giving people a level of comfort, whether it's the parents, whether it's the teachers. Um, and, and so there are lots of ways to get at it, but I think, um, maybe a multifaceted approach would be most uh, helpful. And, and certainly for our program, we've totally redesigned our deposit slip. So it doesn't look like a traditional bank or credit union deposit slip. It actually has a budget worksheet, money worksheet, count it out, um, different ways you can come up to save, with what you, to save for what your goal is. So it's a whole take home experience to do with your grown up at home so that right. you can bring back to save the next week. We take advantage of every opportunity. And just to add something quick, I just I see it from the other side. I guess I see it from the, the student side or, or the younger side, because you know, we do talk about the parents and the teachers. But in a sense, the students or the people that are involved in the programs can be a teacher in and of themselves. Um, you engage the student, you engage the child, and the child gets excited. I mean, I know personally when I was, uh, when I was in high school, I was excited and I wanted to tell my parents about everything that was happening. I wanted to get them involved. If you educate, your parents or you get the children involved in the program themselves, it's not so much as tugging them along, but it's almost that they come along with you for that for that knowledge or for that adventure per se. And it, it really, you know, as long as you do it well enough, you, you can get it done. Fantastic. And we have about two minutes and uh, just one quick final uh, comment if you'd like to make one, or I'd be interested in your thoughts on uh, the future of experiential uh, learning uh, for personal finance, if anyone would like to comment. Well, we're working with um, experiential learning programs in about 26 U.S. states. We anticipate in 2014 it's going to be 35, and then we'll just keep going till we have them all. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Jen. I guess I'd like to say I think the future uh, is very bright, especially here in Wisconsin. You know, as a person who works at a financial institution, I feel so fortunate to have our Department of Financial Institutions here in, in Wisconsin, David's office provides us with so many tools and so many resources. Um, they lead the effort in our Money Smart Week, so we're really doing a lot here in Wisconsin, and I guess I'd just like to challenge all of my fellow financial institution folks to, to do what you can for financial literacy. Get out there, open an in-school um, savings program, teach, um, provide educational resources to parents and students, do whatever you can, and certainly I know David and his office will provide support we need. I'll, I'll just say technology. I think that's going to be a big area for experiential learning, uh, whether it's simulation or uh, apply natural products. Uh, I guess there's really nothing more for me to say. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they really covered it all. I, I, with, within the future of, of education for finance, though, it really starts as early as you can, and, and making that interactive for 
for the student because there's no need to, to force them knowledge because if, if they want it, you make it interactive through any sort of social means or technology means, the knowledge will come across to the student. If it came across to me, it can come across to others. Well, fantastic. I learned a lot. I hope you did too. I appreciate uh, you taking the time out of your day uh, to come uh, to this hearing uh, and I appreciate Fleck coming to Wisconsin as others have echoed and the CFPB for uh, leading the charge. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Thank you all very much. That was some, some really interesting uh, stories and perspectives. Uh, as we transition here, we're going to get to the second panel that we have of the day. Uh, and I'll invite up the moderator for the second panel, who is uh, Sarah Goldenkraub. She's a professor here at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, uh, an associate professor of educational policy studies and sociology. Um, she has an extensive research portfolio, um, which examines the causes and consequences of inequality in post-secondary educational attainment. Sarah. And I, I guess I'd invite the rest of the panelists to come up as well. Hi, good morning. Thanks so much, David. I want to start by thanking Mike Collins and the whole crew that pulled this together. I think this is really an incredible uh, opportunity, and I'm going to echo what he said. It is so nice that you came here so that we didn't have to fly there, although in this case I was actually in Washington yesterday, so I had to fly home rapidly to get here. Um, so this panel is going to be talking about how to prepare students for financial independence in their post-secondary context, and I think this is a great topic right now. It's obviously on everyone's minds. I'm amazed at how many of our, of our own kids are going to be facing this. Yes, I have children too, and I'm just trying not to think about it. So let's just go with that strategy at the moment. Um, so you, we all know that there are more students heading to college today than ever before. And I think even though we know that the cohorts of high school graduates are going to get a little smaller for a while, we should actually expect to see more and more college going because there really isn't a kid out there that when we survey them that says, no, I, I don't want to go. They, they really all basically want to go. And the things that stand between them uh, and the realization of those goals are, are, are things that we're working to overcome. So for example, academic preparation and financial barriers. Those are things that we're going to hopefully make some progress on. So more and more of them are going to show up. And what we know from the demographics is that more and more who show up are actually not going to have all of the equipment that some of us in the past might have had when we got to college. So they're not going to come with a great deal of college know-how. Not to be pessimistic about our efforts in that area in K-12, but it is very, very difficult to equip a student completely for today's college-going situation, which is arguably one of the most complicated landscapes that we've ever had, right? College financing and figuring out how to afford college is difficult because we have such a complicated array of financial aid programs and ways in which people have to put together their, their college affordability schemes. And these people are going to come without college-going parents, with co without college-educated parents. They're going to come with parents who've had less financial stability than students in the past. And they're going to come with uh, different norms and values and past experiences that don't necessarily align with some of the ways in which you know we want them to think about how they're going to finance. So we're going to have more students in college who, for example, are more debt averse, who are more loan averse. You know, this is um, more and more common in in many families to feel like what they've seen growing up makes them afraid to take on a loan. So we're going to have that to overcome. Clearly, we're going to do whatever we can to help them navigate their way to successful uh, pathways. And very importantly, that, that work does not stop when they enter college. It's really not safe to assume that even though a student fills out a financial aid application, the FAFSA, manages to get through the FAFSA, which is an enormous hurdle, they are not safe and clear. So I've spent the last five years with a crew here in Wisconsin working with Wisconsin Pell recipients. And all 3,000 of those students had already filled out the FAFSA by the time they started the study. Mm -hmm. But five years later, I can tell you that hardly a single one of them faced no financial challenges after that. In fact, they faced repeated challenges, even though they'd made it through, including the fact that some of them didn't know they needed to fill it out again. 
year after year. So we need to do things at the campus level. So that's what we're going to be talking about on this panel. We're going to be talking about the strategies that students, families, and schools should consider to help these students not only start post-secondary education, but actually finish post-secondary education successfully. So the speakers today include, include Geraldo Villacruz. He's the Associate Dean of Students at Madison College. Happy to have you here. Janelle Hackley, she's the IDA Program Manager at the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Milwaukee. We have uh, Brian Ashton, the Senior Program Coordinator with the Student Wellness Center who oversees financial education and outreach at Ohio. And Mary Printy, a student at UW-Madison who leads financial literacy campaigns on our campus. They asked me to say a few words about how I also approach the topic um, this morning, and I think as I, as I started to say, I've been conducting research with Pell recipients in Wisconsin for a long time. I'm a scholar activist um, who's deeply interested in economic inequalities and college attainment, and in particular, I like to know what it looks like on the ground. We have lots of policies and practices out there, and we know from a long history of policy research that despite our best intentions, when we write down what should happen, it isn't always what actually happens. And watching students and families try to work their way through practices as implemented on the ground can tell us a lot about what we need to do the next time. So I've really witnessed the struggles that students have when they try to navigate school and work, when they try to take the advice and the financial education that we offer them and figure out how it actually fits into their real life context how it actually jives with what they believe and what they assess if it's real for them. And when they are trying to figure out at the same time what college still means to them and what they're actually getting from it, they're also repeatedly trying to size up whether the financial strategy is working for them. So it's a complicated cognitive process. It's also occurring for, for one group of students, it's also occurring at a time of tremendous development as well, and that needs to be taken into, into account. I'm also doing some work with Single Stop USA, and I, I want to note that this is another approach to financial education for, for college students, particularly those on community college campuses. These are students who have potentially um, are eligible for access to benefits programs, which is something that we don't often talk about in higher education. I think partly because it's, it's only coming to our attention now that poor people really do go to college, and that means they're eligible for far more than financial aid. There's money being left on the table, left and right, and that what Single Stop has found is that when they can spend 15 minutes with them with a nice piece of technology that can evaluate that eligibility, they can help students bring as much as an additional $5,000 a year to their college education. That's almost doubling the Pell Grant. And they do that while also providing financial counseling and tax preparation. So we're doing a large national evaluation to try to sort out whether in fact that's as good as it sounds. So I'm really excited about the panel and what they're going to bring to tell us today about what they've been doing in their work and their ideas on how to address these sorts of issues. So we're going to start by opening the discussion for all of you. Um, I'm, I want to note that the way that we develop solutions to these problems hinges on how we actually define the problem itself. Right? So I've spoken a bit about the challenges that I've seen here, but in, I would like to know in your work what do you find are the financial challenges that students are the least prepared for when they come to college? Would you like to start here? Sure, again, uh, thank you for having us here, for having me here today, uh, representing Madison College, which is, uh, I'm sorry. Is this better? Yes. Okay, I'll lean in. So again, my name is Geraldo Villa Cruz. I'm Associate Dean of Students at Madison College. And uh, at the, is it on? Testing, all right. <laughs> I guess I'm a little shy today, so <laughs> and this kind of shows it. So I'll, I'll lean in for you. Um, again, my name is Geraldo. I'm an associate dean of student at Madison College. Uh, Madison College is one of 16 technical colleges in the Wisconsin system. And you know we've been uh, a, gate, a gateway for a lot of our students uh, that come from diverse backgrounds, uh, historically. Um, we tend to have about a 48% uh, of our students are academically challenged. 60% of them uh, tend to be first generation students. You're looking at one of them. I went through uh, the UW system school myself. And let's be clear about the challenges that our students are facing. We don't know what we don't know, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what it's about. Uh, our families are wonderful, our experiences are wonderful. Um, but it's all about cultural afford uh, contextual affordance. And uh, what we learn from other people and our experiences, whether it's our family. And, so at our college, what we really see is uh, important is to help students realize that they can't control where they came from, good or bad. It is what it is. But what they can do is they can look at 
where they're at today and, and what they want to take from the past that's going to help them. Those, those pro-social skills, habits, whatever those are, to help them move forward. Uh, readiness is huge. Financial readiness is important. That's, the, that's a big one, but uh, there's a lot of other factors that derail our students, and we need to help educate them on all those different factors. Um, we're here to talk about financial readiness and how we can take care of them uh, in this area. And so for us, it's about uh, helping students realize that they have to have a plan in place. Um, no matter what their circumstance, it's on them because the bill's going to them. And so at our college, we brought together a group of uh, um, stakeholders uh, within our college and outside of our college. We've partnered with UW uh, Credit Union, uh, with Summit Credit Union, with Green Path, uh, uh, in addition to our financial aid office. Uh, as the uh, director over our counseling area, we work really closely with our financial aid office. The way that uh, our college has historically run has been reactive in nature, right? A student is struggling, they're having a difficult time, they get s financial aid suspension, they have to develop an academic plan. So what we've done is that we've done a, a reactive uh, approach initially, which is our academic fitness program, which is designed to help students look at why they, where they got, uh, you know, where they are currently, uh, and what they can do about it to, to move forward. And so that's one plan. You can go to our website at madisoncollege.edu and you can uh, read all about it. What we've done proactively is created our FATE program, which is our finan Financial Awareness Training and Education Program. And our whole purpose is to get students to take control of their FATE, their financial future, and they have the ability to do that. But they need to know the, the basic knowledge of what that's about, from how much is college gonna cost, what am I really here for, what I really wanna do. We realize that a lot of our students don't have a clear picture, and they move from program to program, unclear what they want to do, the next thing you know they have this large amount of debt. So we really want them to get focused on their purpose of what they're trying to accomplish here. And it's hard, we're asking a lot for young people. We're asking a lot for returning adults who are coming to the college experience with all this experience and having to deal with the emotional uh, baggage of losing a, a job. And so we really have to get them to really focus on what, what their purpose is and what they're trying to accomplish. And then we help them look at what they're doing that's working, what are the skills they have currently, uh, and what do they uh, need to have some assistance with. So we have a set of modules that we have students go through. Our goal is to try to get them engaged in those modules prior to them coming to campus, from what's the cost of education to how are they gonna pay for it, uh, to when they're in college, once they get that check, what are they doing with it, what's their plan to manage it, to when they get done with school. Uh, how are they going to cover their cost? And so that's a, uh, one of the biggest programs that we're looking at doing now. Great. Thank you so much, Jana. Hi. Oh. <laughs> I have a big mouth. I'm... <laughs> Hello, can you hear? Okay, it's yeah. working now. <laughs> My name is Janelle Hackley. I am the IDA program manager for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Milwaukee. Uh, IDA, I don't know how many know, stands for Individual Development Accounts. And what it is is a low-income, federally funded dollar match savings program. That's a mouthful, I know. Um, but it does work. Whoever sat in that white ivory tower and said, hey, I have this idea. Uh, and the reason why I say it works, and it works very well, is because 85% of the money through this program goes directly to the recipients, mm -hmm. to the participants. And it's normal, normally it's the other way around. So I say thanks to those people who came up with this idea because what it does is it gives the people a leg up financially in school for college. Our program, our education program offers our children a six to one dollar match. Right, a six to one dollar match for every dollar they save we match it with six, of course there's a cap, up to their maximum savings of $667. Um, they can get $4,000 to help pay for their college. And it covers books, tuition, fees, because Lord knows there's a lot. Uh, <laughs> and it also covers a computer. Now, I don't know many scholarship programs that have that, but this one does. And I, let me back up, it is not a scholarship program. Mm -mm. It's, 
the way they tell us to say it is, it's a gift. And I always say, yes, if anyone asks, tell them it is a gift. And if they ask who is it from, tell them it's from your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> it would not be telling a fib because it really is from Uncle Sam, right? right. <laughs> so it, uh, the Boys and Girls Club um, decided that this would be a good program to have for the clubs. Um, so in 2003, we, we applied for the, for the grant and we were able to get it. Um, along with that, right about a year after that, uh, one of the members of our board of trustees passed away. Now here's a man that put his money where his mouth was. He really believed in educating children. As a matter of fact, backing up a little bit about him, he found two individuals who were very marginal in school and took them under their wings. They were like CD students and he decided, he said, listen, for every A you get, I will give you $250 for every A on your report card. For every B, $100 and nothing thereafter. Needless to say, he had some A students, right? And he also uh, proved that, you know, if a child had an opportunity, they would do better. So, when he passed away, he left $5 million to the clubs to educate our low-income children. That's putting your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. or your Okay. That's right. That's so, <laughs> so we have the program. It's been, uh, we had our first class to go through in 2008. We have two graduating classes. A class graduated in 2012 and one class graduated in 2011. 95% of those students finished college. Um, those other 5% we really uh, don't have any stats on, but for one reason or another, they did not make it through the four years. Now, we have that pre-college pre scholarship program through that $5 million that we have. It really and truly helped our children and their parents understand. Someone mentioned the FAFSA. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Who knew? Who knew? We did not have that type of information, especially when I was in college, not, I mean, prior to me going to college up front, that we had to go do it by hook or by crook, if you will. We had to go in there and try to figure out exactly what all those questions we needed to answer mm -hmm. meant, or how we had to put certain information and memorize different things in order to keep going back each year. We work with the parents now. We, the people that we have to manage that pre-scholarship program were students that worked on a college campus that helped students, assisted students in trying to get through their financial situations through college. We hired them on to help us. So now we have somebody who did it on a regular basis to help our students to uh, overcome some of the financial situations that they would be faced with starting out. So once they got on campus, it wasn't a big shock to them. They, they were able to understand how, yes, you're going to have to stand in these lines. Yes, uh, when you, when you um, get on campus, the different people you have to get in contact with. But financially, they, we wanted them to go to college and especially that first year to concentrate on nothing but their education because that first year is really crucial. And we even told them, your first year, we really want you to be selfish. Because there you're gonna get a lot of calls from people wanting you to do this and do that and go here and go there. But you wanna be selfish for your education, be selfish. So the financial part of your uh, education, we wanna make sure we cover that up front. But we, gave, we, we took them to colleges and all kinds of things so that they can understand how things work prior to them getting there. So the pre-scholarship scholarship, scholarship program really worked out very well. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
told you Go I was long winded. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am, I'm, you know, I'm really loving this program. It's the bestest program. I know it's not in the dictionary. B e s t e s t. That's my word. Keep looking; it may pop up there. Well, thank you. And I, I want to actually emphasize what you just said about the selfish. This has come up in our own research as well, is that counter to many assumptions out there that when students are working and they're not studying, et cetera, that what we really need them to do is we want them to focus on their studies. What we actually find is that they're spending time with their families that they're incredibly selfless, in fact, and that the fact is that they're giving so much to their families while they're in college, and that was not something that they were prepared to, to deal with, that it really seems, that we, you know, we've really begun to think that it's having to work with the families on their expectations for how the students are going to manage their time and their resources while they're at school so that the family knows that in order to do good for the family, the, the child's going to have to be selfish while in college. And I think it's very, very hard for them to say no to their families. Yes. So Mary, would you like to go next? Yes. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. <laughs> well, I work, no? Yeah, keep talking. I work with um, ASM, the student government on campus, and I got involved in an internship my first semester here on campus. And I took up the financial literacy campaign because um, I really hit a wall coming to campus myself. And from my experiences and seeing other experiences on campus, one, the hardest thing for students to handle is going from dependent, living with your parents, having them always there, having them check up on you, having them to fall back on, to living independent, and finally re realizing that fruit costs a lot of money, and like mm -hmm. how much food actually costs is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it makes us short-sighted, being dependent. I never thought past like the next paycheck in high school. I didn't need to. I didn't pay for my own food. Most students are short-sighted like that. And I never knew what money lasting a whole year meant. So coming to college and being thrown in that was really, is, I've seen so many students struggle with that and have trouble with that, that transition from dependent to independent and not realizing that there are additional expenses such as peer pressure, you wanna make friends, mm -hmm. so you go out to eat with people and mm -hmm. um, going grocery shopping, how expensive food is, mm -hmm. student org fees, trips, course mm -hmm. readers, textbooks, buying football tickets to go watch the Badgers beat Ohio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and I always knew, <laughs> I always knew textbooks were expensive, but I was not prepared for that $500 bill my first semester for all my books for my four classes. So coming to college, I wasn't prepared. I spent three-fourths of my money from summer on my computer and cool stuff for my dorm. And then I came and had to pay for the textbooks, mm -hmm. and I was near broke by my like second week of college. And um, there's another thing that many students don't realize is that time is limited in college and there's this crucial trade-off between getting paid and being involved. And I chose being involved. I got the internship and my credits were boosted up to 18 credits. I didn't have time to work and I didn't realize I always worked throughout my high school career without work what that would be like, that I wouldn't have time for at all. And a lot of students their involvement on campus um, leads to their success, such as getting um, accepted into certain schools, like I was going for the Wisconsin School of Business. To get in those, you need to be involved. And there is that trade-off of involvement and getting paid. And because I decided to get involved, I'm here, and I led the financial literacy campaign. And we made some great strides, not only um, with students, but connecting with administration and bringing this to the forefront. But because I chose, because I was short-sighted, I didn't know how to independently handle my finances without my parents. And because I chose getting involved, I ended up at the plasma donation on West Gorham. Mm -hmm. every one Monday and Wednesday so mm -hmm. I could have $40 by the end of the week to kind of live on. Like there's that trade-off and I wasn't mm -hmm. prepared for that. I wasn't pre I thought I would be fine, but getting, but getting to college and that, that transition from dependent to independent, I had 
no tools. I had no idea what it would be like. And I wound up at West Gorham at the Plasma Center. <laughs> but um, so the, mo the hardest thing for students is coming from this dependent lifestyle. And students struggle making the shift to the independence with handling their finances. And I've seen it in myself. I'm like the prime example of this. And also in almost all of my friends, we're just, mm -hmm. that transition is the hardest thing for us. Thank you so much. And did you, yes, please, go ahead. Where did you go to get advice? And where would you like to go to get advice? Right, so um, I didn't go anywhere to get advice. <laughs> I kind of took it as a crash course, and I learned to save really fast. <laughs> but I would like, um, I would like somewhere to go. I know that like Madison has these great ways to get help, but I didn't know, and that's what I found out in my internship, and that's how I turned like a 360 from today. But. Um, it's kind of hard because finances are so personal that nobody wants to talk about it or admit that they're in that trouble. So um, I think the biggest problem is changing the climate around that mm -hmm. to get students to want to go get help because I don't think I would have gotten help except for my parents unless it was a norm. And that's the hardest okay. thing to try to combat. Thank you, Mary, and I think it's really great that you also spoke to the role of culture and you, at the peer pressure issue. There's a new book that just came out called Paying for the Party. It's a sociological study of a college campus and it's really excellent because it shows what happens when campuses become increasingly constituted of wealthier students, what happens to students who don't have the resources. You will see what some people call overborrowing on their loans because they are trying simply to keep up and to be involved and to be accepted. And there really is a trade-off that comes with that. They're carrying debt that they know they don't actually want to have, but they really don't think they have a choice. Brian, would you like to go next? Absolutely. Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Brian Ashton. I am a senior program coordinator in the Student Wellness Center at THE Ohio State University. I was going to let it slide and then, uh. Uh, <laughs> okay, you know, calling us out. Um, just to build off of that last point very quickly, we did a study in 2011 of institutions across the state of Ohio. The second biggest cause of financial stress, number one, was the amount of debt that students were incurring and taking out. The number two cause was not having or perceiving that they did not have enough money to participate in the activities that their peers were participating in. So, you know, lending to that point that we are seeing a lot of peer pressure in whatever that may be living situation, that may be paying for the party and whatever goes on on, on a weekend. Um, but we do see that as a huge concern. Um, you know, quickly, a lot of what I was going to say has been, been covered, but the first thing that we really see in terms of the problem is that need for that continuum from K through 12 education into collegiate education. And uh, you know, I really appreciate the two panels bringing that together because a lot of times you have a student who's making a decision about an education in a time that's very emotionally charged. We all want to go to college, and we're, we're seeing that in the, the numbers that are coming out. And they're very emotionally charged and they're, they're going through a process in a language they don't really even understand. And that, that starts on one end with the interest rates as we've, we've talked about. But then on the other end, you know, when we do talk about the FAFSA and the other financial aid pieces, the amount of continuing education that I go through just to keep up, it's amazing that we're able to have students and, and families that are able to keep up with some of the changes that are happening. The second big thing that we really look at on a college campus in, in terms of being, and we run um, large group education, on, online education, as well as peer-to-peer -peer financial coaching, which tries to get at some of that peer-based anxiety. We have about 60 peer coaches that offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. But really what we see is needs that transcend what may be able to happen in the vacuum of just financial education. When we look at the quote-unquote debt crisis that's happening, a lot of what we're seeing more, is more along the lines of a repayment crisis. And we're seeing this especially at Ohio State in students who are stopping out or dropping out. And how do we begin to provide that support on campus to encourage them to, to maintain and stay enrolled? And yes, you know, as, as Michael mentioned, that, that year will absolutely provide higher income. Um, but in those first couple years starting out when that repayment starts, we're, we're seeing a lot of concerns with students moving into default in that time frame. Um, to that effect, on our campus, we formed a financial wellness advisory board, and that board was made up of individuals from undergraduate education, from financial aid, from um, some of our critical difference and emergency scholarship foundations, our Office of International Failures, and all of our partners across campus to really try to look at how do we provide that support for a student in the time of crisis that can get them through 
um, that situation and stay on campus. And also to that effect, one of the big recommendations that came out was how do we become more proactive about having those conversations on the front end? Um, so how do we make sure that students have a four year or five year, unfortunately six or seven year plan to finance their education? You know, we're seeing an increase in students too. When we talk to them, and this is, this is anecdotal, but the conversations we have where they have financing for that first or second year and they say, we'll figure it out in the third and fourth. Um, so you know, how we become more proactive in the front end I think is one of the bigger challenges that we're facing on our campus right now. Great, thank you so much. So right now in Washington, they're having big conversations about the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, which has quite a bit to do with these issues. And we were on the Hill yesterday talking about what's going to happen with financial aid and what's going to happen in terms of changes to financial aid, which has evolved over time. And, and Senator Warren's staff and others were there saying, what can we do to help students to navigate the financial aid system uh, better? And I was curious, from your point of view, uh, how much are these sort of financial challenges that students facing, how much of this is about financial aid? And what is it that they don't know that they need to know? And how much of this is about things beyond financial aid? Would you like to start, Haralda? Again, it, for me, it's a both and. I mean, the reality is that uh, we're responsible for our education and being able to fund that as individuals. Mm -hmm. But again, it comes back to our context. It comes back to where our resources lie. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's face it, it's not fair out there for a lot of our families. And uh, you know, they're struggling, they're working day to day, they're trying to make their you know, things end and to think about having a savings account when you're trying to figure out how to get food on your, on your table, that's just not gonna work. And so I think we have to look larger at how we can support our communities to make sure that we get the employment and we get all this other stuff in place so our, our families can survive and thrive and not just, just survive and be able to make it. And so for me, it goes back into those interventions that K through 12 are doing, how, we could, how the community uh, partners that are formed with the different community centers can get out there and help educate our families. But then it comes back to those adult students, because they're here, they're coming, that, and they're not prepared, how we get them th those, that knowledge that they need to, to navigate the system, having supports, having simplifying the system is important. I mean, I know we talk about how challenging it is, and if you talk to somebody in that area, they'll say, no, it's pretty easy. It's not. Okay. It's difficult. Okay. And it's amazing how challenging it is once you complete a form to then they got to go through a verification. And then what happens mm -hmm. with that whole process? And I think educating our, our students on the life cycle of financial aid is important. Mm -hmm. it's, it's critical for us to be able to do and look at those barriers that are important. I also think that um, you know, we can look at changing habits. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I come from, I have a PhD in counseling psychology, so I really do think it's important to have insight and provide opportunities for our students to, to grow and develop and become aware mm -hmm. of what's driving them and what they can change to, to make those, because in the end, that's gonna, it's on them in the end. But I think as a college, we do need to create better structures that support them mm -hmm. and continue to reinforce the, um, the funding to help us to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Pell Grant, it got me where I'm at today. I'm, not he I'm here because of that Pell Grant. Mm -hmm. I'm here because of the Advanced Opportunity Fellowship, or scholarship, mm -hmm. um, and that blessed my family, but that's what got me here. Great. Janelle, I want to ask you about the situation in Milwaukee. You know, there was a recent survey that came out of the Minneapolis Community and Technical Colleges that showed that one in ten students in that school was homeless. There was a new survey that came out of the City University of New York that showed that four in every ten students in the City University of New York is food insecure. Do you have students attempting college in Milwaukee who are facing these sorts of situations, who are trying to go to college, who are coming from you know, places where they're not even sure how they're going to live or what food they're going to eat, let alone the pizza that they'd like to buy? Well, um, speaking on behalf of the Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, the way we have been able to help our, our students is that our pre-college scholarship program over the last five years have assisted, assisted people who have come from backgrounds where I, one young man for, for sure uh, moved to Milwaukee from Michigan uh, from a dysfunctional family and uh, lived with a cousin and he joined the clubs and within the clubs we, we were able to uh, work with him through the pre-college scholarship program to get him to understand how money work for one because we did have we do have financial literacy classes within uh, that two-year period and also to let him understand and know that if he wanted to go to college it he could do so mm -hmm. um, so what we in going through the program 
he was able to ascertain a number of scholarships. Um, as a matter of fact, he, he got one of the largest scholarships that you can get to Marquette University, the Urban Scholars, which is a four-year free run. He didn't have to pay anything for the four four years. He is our spokesperson, of course. Not only that, um, he was able to go through um, our Youth of the Year program. Not only did he make Youth of the Year for Wisconsin, he made Midwest Youth of the Year mm -hmm. and was able to go through the program for uh, the National Youth of the Year. Uh, through that, he was able to get uh, a large sum of money to help pay for his college as well. So coming from a low income uh, situation and a dysfunctional family, uh, situations can be handled. He, he, and that shows that you can get help if you're looking to go to college. He is a B plus A student at Marquette University mm -hmm. at this time. That's wonderful, all right. Well, I wanna ask um, the last two folks on the panel to speak sort of concretely to what you would like the federal government to begin to do. If uh, there's a member of our audience who likes to say if wishes are fishes, and I think she stepped out unfortunately, but she says if wishes were fishes, what would you do? You know, if you had, if you had your druthers, Mary, what would you have us do? Um, one thing that I think is really um, detrimental is that we make sure that what we show, what we get to students before they come to college is accurate costs. Um, that's one thing that really um, I had trouble with, that I didn't understand the variables and um, the unexpected costs, <laughs> like the football tickets. I mean, they tell you what housing is gonna cost and what your projected meal plan is gonna cost, but you don't know what living the college life is gonna cost mm -hmm. and if you, want, if you don't want to eat at housing and you want to get your own groceries, how expensive that is, especially on campus vendors, super expensive. But we need to make clear that there is variables and um, one of the unexpected costs that we really need to try to um, help because is, is textbooks. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard because a lot of times we don't know our textbooks until the day of our first day of class and then you find out, I need 300 more dollars. And it's, it's terrible. <laughs> um, one thing that ASM is trying to do is um, require teachers to try to post their textbooks at enrollment date. It's suggested at the university, but you can't make professors do anything unless it's like in policy. <laughs> so we want to get policy around that and maybe even policy around keeping textbooks for three years unless some extreme circumstances. That would help so much because you buy these $200 textbooks, you wanna sell them and, um, to other students or back to the UW bookstore and it's out of edition and you can get $2 for it at the bookstore mm -hmm. if you bring it back. So it's a problem, it's a huge problem, and it's an unexpected variable that we need to address um, because we can't plan for it, and especially since we're coming from the dependent lifestyle, we can hardly plan for anything. <laughs> and so that's really, and another thing is we need to um, have these opportunities for personal finance courses, and we need to be able to bring these opportunities to the students. We, um, through my, campaign, I kept on coming to um, Professor Michael Collins at the time, and I'd be like, we should do this, or let's do this. He'd be like, He'd be like we already have this. Like, and he, I'd come to him, I'd be like, we need to advertise a personal finance course, and he's like, it's full. So it's like, <laughs> we need to make sure that these opportunities are being used. And um, one of the thing is getting more personal finance courses, and also, solidifying um, financial capability into the infrastructure of the school. That's one thing that I kind of tried to make some advance because students come and like in ASMR campaigns, financial literacy was picked up like every two years and then it dies when the student goes abroad. And also um, our fa administration and faculty is doing a great job, but they have other roles themselves and we need to take it seriously and solidify it into each um, school's infrastructure for this wellness and this help. And also, um, a big thing that we find out is there's a huge gap between, um, between creating the opportunities and students actually getting involved. 
No student wants to admit that they need help in mm -hmm. their finances. It's something in the culture that we need to change. And one thing with being at UW-Madison and being a part of this unique shared governance structure that we have here involving students and in important in committees on campus is I've seen how effective it is. And one thing that um, we need to make sure is that we have students in the process because once we invest students in student organizations, they're invested and they feel like they need it. Mm -hmm. And we need to work it in with the students because you can prepare all these things, but that doesn't mean students are gonna take advantage of it and that's mm -hmm. the hardest thing. So we need to make sure that we invest students within the program so that we can have them invested. I don't know how you do it with policy, but. Well, okay, so Director Cordray Mary has a few wishes. And unfortunately, we're out of time, so I apologize, but thank you all for, for this session. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your perspectives and thank you to Sarah for moderating the panel. We're now gonna open up for our public comment period and I think that there are some microphones at some place, okay, in the back over here. Uh, I have a list of a few names. We still have a couple spots if anyone wants to talk. Um, so our first uh, speaker is James DiUlio, who's over here, if we can get a mic over this way. And we'll invite people to talk for about a minute, and I'll give you maybe a 10 or 15 second warning. Very good. My name is Jim DiUlio. I'm the director of the Wisconsin 529 College Savings Program, which includes the EdVest and Tomorrow Scholar Plans here in Wisconsin. And I'm also on the board of the National uh, College Plan Savings Network, the uh, National Association of All the Administrators of the 80 plus plans. And. Uh, <clears throat> Section 529 plans look a lot like 401ks, but they are actually municipal securities issued by the states, which allows us to give a number of tax advantages when saving for college, and we are regulated by the MSRB and the SEC. Our uh, two Wisconsin plans here hold about $3 billion, and just last month and this month, about $75 million goes out the door. And I'm happy to see that because it's paying for college expenses uh, for this fall semester. And along the way, these accounts have both received both federal and state uh, uh, tax-free growth. There were some tax deductions on the way in, professionally managed portfolios. And what I really think is important is these are institutionally priced. You think of a large co-op where I can sit and invest hundreds of millions of dollars for ordinary people, and very, very low investment fees only available to foundations and endowments. So how does that relate to what we're talking about today? Well, by and large, most of our investors are either first-time college families or first-time uh, investors. So we spend a lot of money on a lot of time on our outreach, partnering with the uh, various organizations here to do a financial education, be it uh, Money Smart Week or be it uh, financial literacy things with the public libraries or, or whatever. So I'm here today to extend a hand to the federal agencies. We're more than happy to partner with you and also any of the state folks that I haven't had a chance to talk to yet. Uh, please let us know, and we're more than happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tessa Schmidt. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Tessa Michelson Schmidt, and I am from the Department of Public Instruction, and I work as a public library consultant, spe uh, specifically working with children and teen librarians around the state of Wisconsin. And so basically, I just uh, ask that public libraries be considered as partners in financial literacy. Public libraries have a presence in almost every community in over 400 communities here in Wisconsin. Uh, public libraries are considered institutions of information and learning, and especially for families with children. Public libraries are free, they are safe, 
and they are non-judgmental. And as talked about already, this is something that can be really important for this climate and culture about uh, financial literacy. Public libraries have considerable experience and success working with children and families, um, especially of school age children and teens. We are partners during the school year and especially during the summer months. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities to consider the role that public libraries can play in financial literacy. So I just ask that they be considered as collaborators in future conversations. Thank you. By the way, we are doing that uh, at the Bureau. Yep. I work with libraries by the Treasury in Ohio, and for the last five years in particular, they've been strong support for job applicants and people that have worked during the recession. Uh, we're going to be beginning a pilot project with libraries at the Bureau of Financial Education. They are a certain partner in their network throughout the country, trusted, respected, and, and if they're open minded to doing this with us, we'll be doing it with them. And I think we're having a a FLEC agency-wide um, meeting with some library folks. We had one last week that I apparently missed. <laughs> but I know that we were represented. <laughs> Museum and Library Sciences. Yes, great. Uh, our next person up is Mike Summon. Up front here. Good morning, my name is Mike Semin, and on behalf of the Wisconsin Bankers Association, it's 275 members and 23,000 plus employees, uh, thank you very much for coming to Wisconsin. An important component of financial literacy is the educating that takes place between consumers and creditors. To maximize this beneficial practice, creditors, we believe, have an essential responsibility to understand and abide by the rules that govern the industry. Now, in the past several years, the delta of regulatory transformation has provided an environment with tangible obstacles for both parties. And financial literacy is a constant challenge, particularly as consumers and creditors have a finite period of time for the valuable exchange of information. So we believe it's incumbent upon regulatory agencies to procure rules, such as the upcoming truth and lending statement, to be fair, simple, and most of all, consistent. The financial acumen of consumers will definitely increase as a result. We very much thank you for your time and we're happy to help be part of the solution going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joel Thomas. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Wonderful um, speeches, especially that last panel. Hearing it from people my age, I really appreciate that and the opportunity to give us and our generation who's inheriting some of the crises uh, a chance to, uh, to, to let our voices be heard and address some of these system, systemic issues that we're facing. Um, I am a uh, practitioner, former educator and banker, product of financial literacy, same as uh, Alex over there. Um, done some research with fourth graders showing knowledge, attitude, and behavioral changes in randomized uh, control groups versus treated groups. I invited one of them to speak in front of 19 educators and let his voice be heard. Imagine you're in a fourth grader here about assets and liabilities uh, and actually wanting a mutual fund for Christmas. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and he was kind of the Justin Bieber of financial literacy after that. Um, but my, my question is, is uh, I have two questions here. One for uh, Dave uh, Mansell. Um, Dave, you've created the Office for Financial Literacy, one of the nation's most innovative government agencies according to Harvard University as well as one of the nation's most effective teacher training best practices according to the U.S. Treasury, the NIFO program. Given your initiative for breaking new ground, have you ever considered spearheading a Wisconsin version of Oregon's Pay It Forward student loan program or San Francisco's K to C University College Savings Program? And if so, what are the chances of you in the Office of Financial Literacy spearheading a Wisconsin version of Oregon's Pay It Forward pro student loan program so that we, our generation will be able to afford houses? Um, or perhaps a universal college savings program with some of your university partners, perhaps Dr. Collins and the uh, CFPB uh, constituents here. Um, in a place like Wisconsin where although we have a great ROI and job placement, tuition has doubled since 2000 and continues to outpace inflation. My second question is for Dr. Uh, or Mr. Cordry. Thank you so much for coming from DC. Uh, I noticed the Obama administration has recently hired a team of behavioral economists, uh, professors including Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein the authors of the book Nudge, to work on data-driven policy and improving the effectiveness of government health, agriculture, and intervention, interventions concerning the retirement crisis facing many uh, Americans. Can you tell us if and how the CFPB 
Will it be involved or will be partnering with them in any capacity to address the uh, retirement crisis, um, such as through endorsing or promoting innovative automatic enrollment programs or automatic escalation where workers can sign up to have their contribution increased annually, for example, the Save More Tomorrow program? Thank you. Thank, thank you for your questions. I don't know if you want to maybe answer those offline or if Council that works with us to try to understand how different economic concepts, including behavioral economics, could be useful in our work. The issue of, of paying for retirement is an is a interesting one at the federal level, and that's a that's a broader partnership with the SEC uh, and the Social Security Administration and others. But it, it is something that we're uh, concerned about, making sure that there are proper consumer protections in that area, uh, and the types of people you're talking about have been influential uh, at getting more take up of these programs. Uh, opt out rather than opt in as a default mechanism to get more people contributing uh, to their longer term futures. Uh, so it's an area of, of particular attention at the Bureau. Yes. Joel, uh, thank you for your uh, question and it's an interesting uh, thought to uh, have Wisconsin do the pay it forward. Um, I think that's something we should look at and uh, certainly can do that. Perhaps it's a project that the School of Human Ecology might uh, take on. Um, <laughs> with my help. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, no, that's a, a very interesting idea. It obviously will take uh, a lot of partners and commitment uh, through the legislature to make something like that happen, but certainly worth uh, a look. Thank you for the questions and the answers. Is, we have uh, Anya Samak. Hello. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Human Ecology and an affiliate of the Center for Financial Security, and I'm a behavioral economist. Mm -hmm. So um, what I wanted to encourage everyone to start thinking about is something that we do research on, which is how to use technology, and in particular visual representations of complex financial concepts to help in education and financial literacy. And what we're finding is that visual ways of representing some of these complex concepts really do help people to understand them and uh, we hope that can bring behavior change as well. So just wanted to put that out there and I was really excited to hear the panelists speak about experiential learning because we actually have been developing tools that help people to be in a situation where they get to make some decisions online and then see a possible effect in this hypothetical environment. So one important thing with these types of technologies is First, that the great thing about them is they can be disseminated online to a lot of people at a really low cost, but that these types of technologies may have a bigger effect on behavior than just some kind of text-based information. And so we should really consider how to think about delivering the proper, the proper information. Thank you. Melissa, did you want to? is actually, can you hear me, paying very close attention to. Um, we are about to announce uh, and seat a new President's Advisory Council focused on financial capability, but specific, specifically the financial capability of young people. And one of the agendas for that new council is actually to bring on board members who are deep in the technology sector who are thinking about how we're utilizing tools, gamification, and other types of technology and data-led approaches to helping consumers, and especially young people, learn about personal finance and make meaningful decisions for themselves. So thanks for the feedback. In fact, last night with Michael Collins, we had a lovely dinner with some of your colleagues here at the university, hearing about some of the research that's happening in terms of using games to help kids not only sort of get smarter and in working in the games themselves, but applying the knowledge and the learning, the higher learning that they're experiencing in those games to the real world. So thanks for the feedback. Thanks, Melissa. We have one final commenter, George Hofheimer, who's in the back. Uh, welcome to uh, Madison. Thanks for coming from uh, the District of Columbia, uh, where I'm originally from. Now I'm a Badger. So uh, 
Uh, I am the head of research and innovation for a think tank called the Felina Research Institute here in town. And um, we do work with credit unions. And one of the things that we do is work with credit unions to come up with products, services, and business models to help transform the world of consumer finance. Um, they come up with really interesting, speculative, front-end innovation ideas. And one of the key things that they call uh, death threats uh, in, in terms of implementing some of these ideas, whether they're real or perceived, are uh, regulatory challenges. And uh, I would encourage you to uh, think about credit unions and also the banking industry as laboratories for innovation and consider uh, something that I know at the beginning of the CFPB that was considered um, was these things called innovation waivers, where you could uh, grant a waiver to financial institutions uh, to try stuff on a very small scale to help solve uh, a lot of the problems that we are facing here in the consumer finance uh, industry. So thanks for your consideration. Thanks for visiting Madison. Great. Thank you. So we are just about at the end of our program, and I thank everyone for staying with us for this entire time. I'd like to invite up uh, one final person who is uh, from another of the FLEC member agencies, the Social Security Administration, and we have Mar Maria Ramirez, who's the Deputy Area Director for Area 2. Thank you, David. Again, thank you very much for inviting Social Security to also share a few tips and uh, be part of the financial literacy education and dialogue that's happening today. I have heard quite a bit of information, in particular uh, the mayor's personal experience, I think was uh, very touching because we're able to relate with a lot of his experiences. But also, early on I heard that the number one agenda is to be able to have a financially robust and healthy community. And isn't that what we all want, from the young individuals in, in the audience to the advocates out there also? That's what we really want for individuals. So let me just start by telling you a little bit of uh, Social Security is not just for the older Americans. I think a lot of us need to understand that it affects each and every one of our young college students, our young workers out there. The minute you were born, you have a Social Security number. If you immigrated to this country and you want to work, you're given a Social Security number. The number one question that a lot of you might have from your, your young uh, uh, college students that are coming to you for financial guidance is, What's that FICA that they're taking out of my payroll stub? You know, what, what is that about? And it's interesting to know that Social Security is on the forefront to, to be able to answer a lot of those questions. We're on YouTube where we have a YouTube video that's called Social Security 101. What does it matter to me? And a lot of the information there goes ahead and shares information with individuals that are just coming into the workforce to explain to them how it's calculated, why it's deducted, and what happens to that money. Uh, again, giving them a little bit more of an of a education as to thinking about retirement. And that's what we'd like to also share with you is being able to promote for people who are age 18 and over to be able to go in and establish a MySSA account. As of January 7th of this year, we have 8 million Americans that have signed up. And that's something that we can all advocate for, is to go in, find out your own personal information. Because with that information, your own personal information, then you have extra tools to then make decisions. Make decisions that will affect you for when you do retire. Or when, uh, unfortunately, if you have an accident and you become disabled, that you are armed with the necessary tools to make uh, right decisions. The other interesting thing is that Social Security is also providing information through YouTube videos, but we're also on Twitter, on Facebook, and even on Pinterest, if a lot of you didn't know that. But if you also go on your mobile device, if you've got an Android, a Blackberry, an iPhone, or any type of a, a window-based phone, you can go to www.socialsecurity.gov, G-O-V, and it'll take you to our mobile site. Whole wealth of information there. 
in terms of what you need, of uh, financial literacy to, to make wise decisions uh, about where to go, even something as simple as not needing to go into our offices anymore to stand in line for a replacement card. Those things are important when you, when you live in a new city because you're here uh, studying and you don't know where the closest Social Security office is to you. Go there, get information, and that way you'll save yourself time and money uh, trying to drive around, around the city trying to figure out where the offices are. It's, uh, again, very interesting that one of the commentators said that wishes are fishes, and definitely that's something that Social Security is really looking and hearing a lot of the needs of, of the young Americans is what, what does it take to disseminate that information out to you? And that's exactly why we're on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Pinterest. So please take advantage of all those services. Out there on the table, I've got a couple of... Uh, pads uh, for your computer, I've got some green bags, but more importantly from those giveaways, I really want you to be able to take away with you an eight and a half by 11 sheet that'll give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to go ahead and open up your own My SSA page. And when you do it, you can turn around and you can share it with your loved ones or you can share it with your students, you can share it with all of those around you because now you have that experience, you have your own account, you've seen your personal information and you're going to be the ambassador of this information. And again, give them an extra tool. So again, thank you very much for inviting Social Security to be here with you, and um, great conference. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm just gonna wrap up. I just went on the Social Security website as you were talking there, and I noted they have a list of the top baby names, I guess, by Social Security. But the, the ninth most popular female name is Madison, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, <laughs> but moving on. Uh, but no, so thank you all again for, uh, for being here and for sharing all your stories. I mean, we heard a lot of personal anecdotes, uh, you know, stories from real students and real people who are out in the field, which I think is really important. Um, it'll certainly, I think it certainly informs all of us, but especially as we're making policy, um, whether it's the Higher Education Act or other, uh, other agency um, policies that come out, this will all inform that. Um, I would certainly invite you to remain in touch with all of us. So my email is david.soo at ed.gov. I think you can probably find contact information for the other people who are here. Um, we certainly welcome feedback at all times. You know, I, we, we often go out and meet people and they say, oh wow, there's real people who work at the Department of Education. I didn't, you know, people are often surprised that we're nice and friendly and really looking to talk to people. So, so please do be in touch with us. Um, so again, I'd like to thank all the panelists and all the presenters and all of you who uh, gave us feedback, and thank you for coming. <laughs>